So well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for our lecture series. And my name is Carrie Young and I am SF Heritage's Communications and Programs Manager. And so our all virtual series this year focuses on women in preservation to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. And we are pleased to continue our series tonight with a program focused in part on the women who shaped the history of important Asian and Pacific American historic sites in San Francisco. Uh, and quickly for those who are new to SF Heritage, we are a nonprofit organization founded in 1971 with a mission to preserve and enhance San Francisco's unique architectural and cultural identity. And over the past five decades, we've worked collaboratively with communities to save the city's historic built environment and cultural heritage assets. Uh, we also help preserve and provide access to the 1886 Haas Lilienthal House, a National Historic Landmark, and the only single family residence of the period open to the public in San Francisco. And starting tomorrow, we're actually reopening the house for new reservation only flashlight tours. Uh, and so you can visit us at sfheritage.org uh, if you'd like to reserve your spot. Uh, and so tonight, I'm really pleased to introduce our host and moderator, Michelle Magalong, who is joining us all the way from the East Coast. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, she is a presidential postdoctoral fellow in historic preservation at the School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at the University of Maryland. Uh, her research on social justice, community participation, and historic preservation in Asian American and Pacific Islander Americans. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, she's drawn, uh, her work is drawn from her work as the president of the Asian and Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation, also APIA HIP for short. Uh, and she received her MA and PhD in Urban Planning from UCLA. And so Michelle will briefly introduce our fantastic panel of speakers and our format in just a second. But first I wanted to note that throughout the program, everyone can submit their questions using the Q&A button along the bottom of their Zoom windows. And once I get the live stream up on Facebook, those can um, those there can ask questions as well. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Michelle. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie. Um, first off, let me move to the next slide. Um, first, I would like to acknowledge that this virtual session is taking place throughout the unceded territory of the United States, uh, which is home to nearly 600 tribal nations. And this event is hosted by San Francisco Heritage, which is on unceded territory of the Ohlone people. So as I begin this session, I acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our various regions. Um, and land acknowledgement is a critical step towards working with Native communities to secure meaningful partnership and inclusion in the stewardship and protection of their cultural resources and homelands. So let's take a moment to honor these ancestral grounds we are collectively gathered upon and support the resilience and strength of all Indigenous people who have sh um, been shown worldwide. I am currently presenting online from my home in Washington, D.C., which is on the traditional unceded territory of the Nanachtok Acostian Piscataway people. Uh, may we stand arm in arm with indigenous communities past, present, and future. So I uh, want to th welcome everyone uh, to this session tonight uh, with San Francisco Heritage. I thank them for hosting um, Intersections of Racism, Gender, and Historic Preservation in San Francisco's Asian and Pacific Islander um, American communities. Again, my name is um, Michelle Magalong, and I will be the moderator for tonight's um, session. Um, so tonight we have um, five uh, folks uh, representing San Francisco's diversity within the Asian and Pacific American um, context. Uh, we have Ed Tepborn from Angel Island Immigration Station, Erica G from the Chinatown Community Development um, Corporation, um, and she is also a board member with API HIP. Karen Kai and Grant Din are also board members um, for API HIP. And then uh, we have MC Kanlas, who you've probably seen him as a fixture in some of Filipinas neighborhood um, in the south of Market. Um, and so 
um, each of these speakers today, tonight, um, will talk about um, places in the city um, that really talk about these intersections of racism, race, gender, and historic preservation. Um, and just real quick about API HIP. Uh, API HIP is a volunteer-led uh, national nonprofit organization um, that focuses on elevating local stories um, associated with Asian and Pacific Islander American history and places. And so San Francisco is a very um, important place for us. Um, our very first national forum in 2010 was held in San Francisco and we held it again in San Francisco in 2016. Um, and we've been um, honored to partner with folks like San Francisco Heritage, Angel Island Immigration Station, Chinatown um, CDC, and the Bayani Han Center, um, along with uh, a few more other organizations and individuals throughout the city. And so we wanted to highlight uh, some of the um, places in the city um, that you could potentially check out if you live in the city or nearby, um, social distanced, of course, or you can go online and learn more. Um, so, uh, without further ado, um, I would love to um, invite Ed as our first speaker. Thanks so much, Carrie and Michelle. I really appreciate the invitation by San Francisco Heritage and Asian Pacific Islander Americans for Historical Preservation to be part of tonight's presentation. It's an exciting time for us at the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. And part of that is because we have some very exciting news to share in that we're opening up the Angel Island Immigration Museum later this month in the former public hospital building. But before I go further with my comments, I do wanna also acknowledge that Angel Island is part of the ancestral lands of the Coast Miwoks. After the US took ownership of the islands in 1848, the government established a military base on the island and subsequently a quarantine station. And with the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and other laws that essentially barred immigration from most Asian and Pacific Islander countries, the government wanted to have an immigration processing center to enforce these exclusionary immigration policies. So from 1910 to 1940, over 500,000 immigrants were interrogated and detained at the former US immigration station at Angel Island. Next slide, please. Unequal treatment of Asian and Pacific Islanders was seen not There's special boards of inquiry, which was just a benign word for grueling interrogation that was much shorter for Europeans, whereas for Chinese detainees, they were often asked hundreds upon hundreds of questions to verify their identity. And we also know that for single women traveling alone, they often had to somehow prove that they were not prostitutes, nor were they likely to become a public charge, or in other words, a financial burden to the US government. In terms of length of detention, Europeans typically spent only a few days in detention, as opposed to Chinese detainees who more typically spent weeks and months. Next slide, please. On this slide, speaking of length of detentions, the image that you see uh, on the left, actually, could you advance one more slide for me, please, Michelle? Thank you. The image that you see on the left is of Kwok Shi, a young 20-year-old woman who immigrated from China. She served the longest period of detention of any man or woman on Angel Island. And during that time, she was repeatedly interrogated, denied access to a lawyer, and survived a smallpox outbreak. She was also isolated from her husband. So her story is definitely one of trauma and persistence. On the right-hand side is Tai Liang Schultz, 
Unlike the other women in my presentation, Tai was born in the US. She took the civil service exam in 1910 and became the first Chinese woman to work on Angel Island where she served as a translator for Chinese detainees. And after California enfranchised women in 1911, she voted in the 1912 presidential primary, becoming the first Chinese woman to vote in the US and perhaps in the world. If you can go back a slide, Michelle. And on this image, I just wanted to quickly tell the story of uh, four other women who came through Angel Island. Often when people think of Angel Island, they think only about the Chinese detainees that were there, but there's so many diverse stories that are part of Angel Island's complex history. On the left-hand side, we see Ambrosia Ravello, who immigrated with her husband, and at the time, the U.S. only allowed 50 persons a year from the Philippines. She happened to be number 17. Like other married couples, she and her husband were separated from another during their detention on the station, and they were released after five days. One person over, we see Hatsumi Imagawa Kumagai, who came to the U.S. as a Japanese picture bride. In other words, her marriage to a Japanese man was arranged via a matchmaker, who exchanged photographs between the prospective bride and groom. In her case, her parents arranged her marriage, and her husband-to-be's family did not tell him about the marriage arrangements until Hatsumi was released from, the Ma from Angel Island, and they were married the very next day. Next over, we see Maria Lopez, who witnessed her husband get brutally murdered right in front of her. She and her infant son traveled to Mexico, from Mexico to San Francisco by boat, and because she was pregnant with twins and her son had whooping cough, they were seen as likely public charges, and immigration officials planned to deport them. According to her family, she told a guard that she needed the best lawyer she could get, and the guard jokingly replied to write to President Woodrow Wilson, which she did, and the family says that First Lady Edith Wilson sent a telegram urging them to allow her in. And finally, on the right-hand side, we see Rosa Ginberg. She and her parents fled Nazi occupation in Vienna in 1940 through Shanghai. She was one of hundreds of Jewish refugees who passed through Angel Island, and her granddaughter, Heather, has written a musical about her grandmother's life. So my last slide, if you could just advance two slides, please, Michelle. Is I just want to end by saying that as we think about the intersection of racism, gender, and historic preservation, I hope that we can move from a history of exclusion, past separated integration, towards more meaningful inclusion of all of our beautifully diverse histories. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Ed. <laughs> So, um, so I'm Erica G, um, and I work at the Chinatown Community Development Center, which is a um, community development and affordable housing organization in San Francisco's Chinatown. Next slide. So um, one of the things that Chinatown has um, was in the past during the time of the Angel Island Immigration Station and continues to be is an immigrant gateway. So, you know, many of our current immigrants um, from China um, are still coming to the area and Chinatown is a place where they are making their first home to, in the United States, um, Chinatown is a place where you can get local foods, you can um, get a job not speaking fluent English, it is a place where you are with your countrymen and so it has played this role throughout its history and continues today. And the other aspect is that Chinatown, you know, has um, many of the immigrants are low income, you know, coming into the United States. And so, you know, these um, services are um, very important for this new population. Next slide. So for women coming to the United States, um, in the early in the late 19th century and the early 20th century oftentimes they were coming to be um, married to other folks um, um, so because of the restrictions of the um, 1882 chinese exclusion act um, increasingly um, women were not allowed to you know come to the united states and some of the women who were coming um, were to get married to folks, um, the men who were here who weren't able to go back to China to you know, marry and bring their wives if they didn't have a lot of money. Um, another aspect though was that sometimes you know, women were trafficked in this case and they were, um, had to flee um, 
sham marriages or abusive marriages or just really unfortunate um, domestic situations. And this is Gumboon, um, which is called the Oriental House and it was established in 1868. And it was a shelter education and vocational training and still continues to this day. So um, it was also a place where if women were on their own, they were studying or they were employed um, and maybe without a, you know, a husband or a family that they could live there and it would be low cost for them. So in 1906, um, this is not the original building or the original location. This is 1940 Washington, um, but it was rebuilt in 1912 after the earthquake. And this is um, a building designed by Julia Morgan. Um, it is uh, one of three and we'll see another one of these um, buildings that Julia Morgan um, built, uh, designed in Chinatown. And, you know, one thing about, oh, the connection to Chinatown CDC is that um, this is a nonprofit service organization and what do they know about rehabbing and um, preserving a building? And Chinatown CDC with its um, housing expertise was able to provide some technical assistance and part of a $3.8 million um, um, from a seismic safety program, which came from a city bond, um, provided the funds, you know, in order to um, make this seismically safe and bring it up to date and provide ADA accessible, um, uh, making the building ADA accessible. Next slide. The next building is Cameron House. And Cameron House is called Cameron House after Dundalina Cameron. And she was a, she's originally from New Zealand um, and she was part of the Presbyterian Church. Um, and one of her roles was to minister to the women of Chinatown. And she was also at Angel Island talking to the um, Chinese women there. She was considered um, the angel of Angel Island um, by many women who were there. So after Angel, so for example, um, Cameron House, you know, provided a home for, for women who were escaping, um, say prostitution, sweat sops, or domestic service, but also women who were um, first coming to the United States. So my, my cousin's grandmother, she was pregnant at the time at Angel Island, and they wouldn't just um, release her so she went to Cameron House first, and then she was able to have her baby um, while she was staying at Cameron House, you know, as her first part of her entry in, into the United States. And so, you know, this building is also designed by Julia Morgan. It, is, it was built in 1908. Some of the built bricks are the, um, they are leftover bricks from the previous building that they salvaged after the earthquake and fire. And um, it continues to um, serve the changing needs of individuals and families. Um, but at the time, they sort of rescued girls, uh, taught them skills, um, and it was in an, an, um, Christian faith. And, you know, it continues to serve the community with youth programs and other immigrant services. Um, and it, it's also San Francisco landmark number 44. Next slide. So this last piece is a park um, and it does have some uh, historical um, markers. Like it does have a Robert Louis Stevenson um, monument that was uh, dedicated to the city at, in 1897, um, as well as several other um, artwork, public artworks that are there. Um, but Portsmouth Square serves as a key open space in, in Chinatown, and it is um, set for a renovation project, and this is the new design, so this is not what it currently looks like, but will look like in, we hope, less than 10 years. Um, it will have an expanded, expanded clubhouse. It will have a new park. It will have a larger area for um, gatherings and festivals. And it will have more um, uh, access um, 
that will make the park more accessible. So I encourage everybody who is from San Francisco to um, look at your ballot and Prop A has, it's a parks and recovery bond and um, it includes funding for parks such as um, Portsmouth Square um, in, in this package. So we encourage you to vote and also to support our parks. Thanks, Erica. And next we have Karen Kai. Karen, if you can, show, oh, there, great. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you. I'm presenting today the story about lost legacies. One regained, another still lost, and others being rediscovered. The Issei Women's Building that you see here was the home of the Japanese YWCA. It was a response to societal racism faced by Japanese and other Asian immigrants in the early 1900s. Today, it is a symbol of community empowerment inspired by the legacy of our Issei women. For Issei, that's the first generation of Japanese Americans, Issei women, the transition to life in America was difficult. Cultural and social isolation were common. Many barely knew the man in the picture to whom they had been married. Others were more fortunate and they had more stability and social support much of it coming through the Japanese Christian churches. Finding though that the white YWCA did not allow girls of color to lodge or have full access to YWCA facilities, the Issei women founded the first Japanese YWCA so that their community's women could find lodging and educational programs that would help them adapt to American life. The Issei women rented space for their programs, but dreamed of having a building of their own. In order to do this, they had to evade the alien land law. This law barred aliens ineligible for citizenship, and that meant Asians, from owning real property. The Japanese YWCA decided to create a land trust and ask the San Francisco YWCA to be the paper owner on the title deed, but creating a property trust in favor of the Japanese women. Japanese YWCA leader Yona Abiko knew of these trusts through her husband, Kyutaro, who had used the land trust device to establish Japanese farming colonies in the, in the Central Valley. She and another board member of the San Francisco YWCA visited Kyutaro's attorney shortly before the San Francisco YWCA established such a trust in 1921. And this was a, a really courageous act by the San Francisco YWCA. There were penalties for evading the land law that included arrest and imprisonment and a cheat of the property to the state. It was a big deal. After purchasing the 1830 Sutter property in 1921, the Japanese YWCA was really able to grow and flourish. And in 1932, they were able to open a new building designed and built for them by Julia Morgan. During World War II, however, the building was returned, was actually put in trust by the women to the, the uh, San Francisco YWCA. They wanted someone they could depend on to look after their property while they went off to, well, they didn't quite know where and were gone for the duration of the war. But during the time, the San Francisco YWCA leased the building to the American Friends Service Committee. And the Friends were one of the most active groups providing assistance to Japanese Americans who were in the internment camps. And so it was a very um, thoughtful and appropriate arrangement. 
when they returned, the Japanese women were grateful to the friends who were still the main tenant of the building and so did not seek to reclaim the site and found that it was okay because the friends were open to having them be there and conduct their activities in the building. The reception from the San Francisco Y was not welcoming, however. The returning women were told that they were not allowed to reform their organization because during the war, the national YWCA had implemented what was called an integration policy. And this policy forbade the formation of new single race centers. Now, of course, this should not have applied to the Japanese Y because they were not a new organization, but this was the position that they were put in. Solving the problem, though, the Buchanan YMCA stepped forward. Having gotten their building back, they offered the Japanese women a home for their organization and formed the first, and it may have been the only joint YM, YWCA in the country. The Friends left the building in 1960, and the Y moved its, the main Y, moved its programs into the building and rented space to others. In 1985, Nihomachi Little Friends Preschool became the sole Japanese organization housed in the building. The Japanese YWCA and the work of the Issei women had largely been forgotten in all the years through the war, through redevelopment, and all the political and social upheaval and change that had occurred between 1942 and 1985. But in 1996, community eyes turned to the building as the San Francisco YWCA announced that it would be selling it at market rate in order to meet their financial needs. Unable to find financing or community-based buyer, the only glimmer of hope lay in the memories of community elders who thought they were called that the San Francisco Y had made promises that there would be an offset against the sale price for community contributions to the building's creation. In hopes of finding this agreement, a community organization was allowed to review the SFYWCA's minutes, but instead they found the land trust. They found in the YWCA's minutes the language stating that they would hold the property in trust for the Japanese women and girls. There was hope then that faced with evidence from their own records, as well as corroborating documentation, the San Francisco YWCA would concede ownership of the building to the Japanese American community. And next slide, please, Michelle. The San Francisco Y's refusal to recognize the trust established by their predecessors led to community organizing and a lawsuit. That lawsuit was settled in 2002, resulting in Nihomachi Little Friends Preschool becoming the owner of the building and in an unprecedented act of good faith by the organization, they signed an agreement to also act as the steward of the building and the legacy of the Issei women. In the end, the SFYWCA got the money it wanted but lost an important part of its legacy by reneging on the trust created by their predecessors. NLF has a stable home that has allowed it to flourish, and the Japanese American community is rediscovering the history and legacy of its Issei women ancestors and its connection to other communities in the Western edition. NLF has kept its promises to be the steward by caring for the building and working to preserve the Issei women's legacy. And in the most recent example of that, uh, the Japanese YWCA was added to the National Register of Historic Places this year. And just yesterday, the San Francisco Historic Preservation Commission initiating, initiated landmark designation for the San Francisco Japanese YWCA Issei Women's Legacy Building. Thank you. 
Thank you, Karen. Wonderful news also to kind of pull it all together. Such a wonderful story of a site. So next we have Grant Din. Thanks a lot, Michelle. Uh, next slide, please. There's a lot of text on here because there's a lot of history that I'm gonna try to cover in my five minutes. Uh, Joseph and Mary Tate challenged San Francisco's whites only schools in 1884 when they tried to enroll their daughter Mamie into Spring Valley School on Union Street. Mamie's in the middle of that photograph there, Mary's on the right. But who were the tapes? Why would they take this bold st step? Mary came to the U.S. in 1868 at the age of 11, possibly as an orphan, or sent to the U.S. like many girls and young women from China as a muizai, a servant, or possibly bound for prostitution. As Erica mentioned, the roles of Chinese women in early San Francisco were pretty bad. There were a few opportunities for Chinese women in these early days, and some of these young women had to clean and do chores at brothels, others at private homes. In the 1860 census, there were fewer than 1,000 Chinese women in San Francisco, and the listed occupation of over 90% of them was prostitute. Opportunities for these early Chinese immigrant women were few. So somehow this young girl escaped her life of servitude and ended up at the Ladies Protection and Relief Society, uh, which is located near Van Ness Avenue, I believe, uh, outside of Chinatown, where she was taking care of a by a Miss McGlattery, and she became quite westernized and even became known as Mary McGlattery because there was no knowledge of what her Chinese name was. It was different than Cameron House. It, it didn't serve, uh, this Ladies Protection Society did not serve a lot of Chinese uh, girls and women, but it helped out Mary. So a man named Ju Dip was 12 when he came to the U.S. in 1864 and went to work as a house servant for a man named Matthew Sterling, who was a dairy rancher on Van Ness Avenue. He could believe cows in San Francisco. And eventually dro uh, drove Sterling's milk wagon, which was a step up for the domestic work that he first did. Both Jew and Mary lived outside of Chinatown. And he met Mary in 1875 when he was 23 and she was 18. They married within six months and for some reason took the name Tape as their last name. Uh, Joseph's surname, uh, or um, Jew Dip's surname of Jew became his first name of Joe, or Joseph, and he began his own hauling and delivery business and also delivered Chinese immigrants from the docks where they arrived to their new homes, usually in Chinatown. So he's quite the entrepreneur. The tapes lived for a while on Vallejo Street near Octavia and had a child in 1876 who they named Mamie, and then three other children. Living in a mostly white neighborhood, they mostly had white friends and felt a part of the overall San Francisco community with the rights one would expect. But in 1860, California had barred Negroes, the Mongolians, and Indians, quote unquote, from public schools, and many districts established segregated schools. In 1870, the requirement of education of Chinese children was dropped. So if you were a Chinese student in, in anywhere in California, there was no guarantee of any education. Any Chinese wishing to attend school in San Francisco had to go to mission schools in Chinatown. In 1875, the San Francisco School Board voted to allow black students to allow schools with white students, but most black students still attended segregated schools. In 1884, just two years after the Chinese Exclusion Act that Ed mentioned, the tapes tried to enroll Mamie in Spring Valley School. Principal Hurley refused her enrollment and the tapes sued the school district in Tape versus Hurley and won at the lower court. And when it was appealed, they even won at the California Supreme Court. The case guaranteed the right of children born to Chinese parents to public education. However, immediately, the California legislature passed bills to establish a separate school system for Chinese and other, quote, Mongolian children. This established the Chinese primary school in San Francisco. Originally, Mary Tape wrote an angry letter to the school board saying her children would never attend such a segregated school, addressing it to uh, a Mr. Mulder, who I believe was the school board president. May you, Mr. Mulder, never be persecuted like the way you have persecuted little Mamie Tape. Is it a disgrace to be born a Chinese? Didn't God make us all? What right? 
have you to bar my children out of the school because she is Chinese descendant. Mamie Tape will never attend any of the Chinese schools of your making, never. I will let the world see what justice there is when it is governed by the race prejudiced men. Unfortunately, uh, the school board did not give in and Mamie enrolled, Mary enrolled Mamie and her brother Frank in the, the Chinese public school. It later became known as the Oriental School when it started to enroll Japanese and Korean students. Now here's another example of the San Francisco uh, segregation affecting even greater than San Francisco um, issues. The Japanese government strenuously objected to such segregation of uh, Japanese students and created an international incident. At the same time, anti-Japanese forces were urging the United States government to curb the admission of Japanese laborers. The Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907 resulted and allowed Japanese students to attend schools with whites in San Francisco, but curbed the immigration of Japanese laborers. So that was quite a trade-off. Those Japanese men who were here could send for their families, which resulted in picture uh, marriages and picture brides coming to the US, as Ed also mentioned. Arranged marriages where families worked out uh, these marriages, which had already a, a tradition in Japan, only this time the women didn't get to meet the men before they sailed to the US. By 1917, the government, the US government set up an Asiatic barred zone, and by 1924 curbed pretty much all immigration from Asia and greatly reduced it from non-Western Europe. Uh, next slide, please. So these are not the original buildings for Spring Valley on the left and the uh, Chinese primary school on the right. Um, but they, are, they were built after the earthquake and fire destroyed pretty much all of Chinatown and most of the eastern part of San Francisco. Um, so uh, on the left is the building for what's now called the Spring Valley Science School. And I've clipped the um, text from the websites for both schools. So you can see that both schools are paying great attention to their histories. Um, and I, I didn't see any plaques when I went to the sites. I didn't really look for them, but you can see that the, the schools still tell that story. Um, on the right is Gordon J. Lau Elementary School that started as the Chinese primary school, then later was the Oriental School, then Commodore Stockton, and finally today, Gordon J. Lau Elementary. And Gordon Lau was the first Chinese American, first elected Chinese American supervisor in San Francisco. Eventually, the tapes frustrated that they couldn't get their children into integrated schools moved to Berkeley in 1896, where there were integrated schools. Uh, Mary became an accomplished photographer and artist, and Joseph worked for Southern Pacific and was also a volunteer firefighter. And the tapes lived a um, pretty prosperous middle-class existence. They had a family ranch in Hayward and a spread in Ukiah. But over time, Chinese children started attending white schools in San Francisco after Tape versus Hurley, even though it wasn't officially authorized. Um, California's laws sanctioning segregated public schools were finally repealed in 1947, seven years before Brown versus Board of Education. So if you want to um, know more about the Tape story, I really recommend reading May Nye's book called The Lucky Ones, and it tells the whole story of the Tape family. And I have one more slide. It's not relevant at all to my story, but I just wanted to show this 1916 ad uh, for a, a housing development in the sunset. And you can see uh, it offers nothing but homes, no flat stores, apartments or saloons, no Africans or Asiatics. So it's a sign of the times back then, unfortunately. And it wasn't until the 1940s um, that, uh, we could identify specific Chinese families moving into the sunset. Chinese Historical Society had a really excellent exhibit about Chinese in the sunset where this ad was taken and uh, they did a lot of research for on this topic. So thank you very much, uh, Carrie and Michelle, and on to MC. All right, thanks, Grant.
And last but not least, uh, we have MC Kan Last. I forgot to put the T at the end of your name, MC. I apologize. Um, so if you can uh, carry us home, MC. Okay, can you show the slide? <clears throat> okay, my name is uh, MC Kan Last. I work with the Soma Filipinas as a member of the historic committee, but I'm also part of the Filipino American Development Foundation, Bayanian Community Center. And Soma Pilipinas, as you know, was the, among the first uh, cultural heritage district that was adopted by the city in 2016. And then in 2017, one year later, the state of California selected 14 uh, cultural district uh, uh, city uh, statewide and Soma Pilipinas was uh, among them. So if you see this map, the yellow colored uh, areas is the boundary of Soma Pilipinas, 2nd Street, Brannan, Levent, and Market. And then the topic for today connected to the history that we're sharing is the Victoria Manalo Dreads Park, the one on the green. And if you see the green note, that's the current name, Vicky Manalo Dreads Park. But before that, perhaps those who are familiar with San Francisco, that's the location of the Bessie Carmichael Elementary School. And then uh, before that, the former name of that particular two acres is called the Columbia Square Park. And the title of my presentation is From Columbia Square to Bessie Carmichael to Victoria Manalo, a weaving of narratives of colonialism, racism, uh, uh, gender and historic preservations. So we heard about the, the other stories, so let's go to the place first, okay? Next slide. So Victoria Manalo, perhaps not everybody knew who Victoria Manalo Draves. I'll just read this one. Victoria Manalo Drave was the first Asian American woman to win an Olympic medal when she earned gold medals in three meter springboard and 10 meter platform diving competition at the 1948 Olympics. Born in the south of market area to an English mother and a Filipino father. Victoria Manalo Draves attended the school adjacent to the site, which later became the Bessie Carmichael Elementary School. Uh, Victoria achieved her success despite facing discrimination early in her diving career. Her achievement continues to serve as an inspiration for all athletes interested in competition regardless of race, greed, and national origin. Okay, let's go to the next. So this is the face of Vicky uh, uh, in 2004. And in 2005, we uh, officially uh, moved the school to the Bessie Carmichael, and then the park is named after her. So this is uh, her picture. And the good thing about this one, like I said, it's a uh, weaving up a different narrative. So it's important to share who Victoria Manalo Drapes, park, Drapes. He was a product of mixed marriages. We heard about exclusion, we heard about discrimination before. So his parents were product of the anti-miscegenation uh, laws during the time that was prevailing. So I mean, say mixed marriages is not acceptable during the time. But because the Filipinos were not classified in the Mongolian terms, so uh, the marriage uh, succeeded, no? the, the parents. But then later, because there's anti-Filipino during that time, they exposed that the Filipinos should be included in the anti-miscegenation, but then they cannot classify them as Mongolian. So they included when the, when the uh, uh, a law was passed because of a certain Filipino won in the court because he wasn't really a Mongolian, they classified and they included the Malay, Malay race, no? As part of the uh, part of the law in the mixed marriages, and then at the same time, the situation is felt not only by the parents because uh, the parents is a Filipino and a British. Uh, the the impact was on Victoria because when he was uh, learning the or joining the swimming team, 
he wasn't accepted by the team because of her family name, Manalo. So the father wasn't even approached by the coach, which is asking the mother if they can use Taylor as his family name to be included in the, in the, uh, in the team because they don't like the Filipino family name. But then uh, Victoria didn't like that. So what happened, Phil Patterson and Victoria formed their own separate club in order to have a regular training in the Fairmont uh, uh, swimming uh, area. So that's the situation. But then in 19, uh, during the war, Phil Patterson left. So Victoria don't feel good being discriminated with the, with the rest. So he decided just to, to work and, and uh, continue. Later, he was uh, introduced with the other coaches which later became her husband, Braves. But then he, he started competing and winning in the national competition. Again, when they were about to select the US team, he wasn't allowed because again, he has a Filipino last name. So he married Draves, so he became Victoria Manalo Draves. So it means your ancestry, your ethnicity is a big uh, uh, baggage during that time. So it's really hard. And then, although she wasn't number one in the U.S. team, but then during the Olympic, he won the two, two, two gold medals and she won. So that's the discrimination she experienced. But then in the, in the U.S., uh, when he came back, uh, she was uh, being recruited to play as Jane of Tarzan. Remember, Johnny was smaller, was the... Uh, diving champion also in the earlier Olympic and then it became the symbol of Tarzan but then they wanted her to be Jane as you know in the movie Jane is just a prop of Tarzan because it's really a, a male oriented thing so but uh, but uh, Victoria declined that uh, offer okay but then there's another discrimination can we move to the second one so Victoria was a student when Principal Bessie Carmichael was handling the school for 25 years, the Franklin and Lincoln Grammar School. That's the location. And then that's in, on 8th and Harrison. And then the ad, on the 8th and Harrison, there's a park. They call it Columbia Square Park. So that was the, the park. But then when the Freeway 101 was uh, to be built, they need to demolish the school. And then the school district didn't want to, to put another school in South of Market because the students are mostly poor people. So they need to bus them to other school. But then Principal Bessie Carmichael fought the school district and he argued that is it because they were poor, you're not giving us the school. So he fought until he retired. And then in 1954, he finally won, but then he, he passed away that year. So when they opened, they built the school in the Columbia Square Park. But then they didn't build it as a permanent school. It's made of bungalow. So it will only last for 50 years. So that's why it's really ironic because the school district, we heard about uh, exclusion. We, uh, the, the situation is this one. So... If you go to this uh, park, you will see the cannon you know, located in Columbia Square Park. Let's go back to the next one. Oh, let's go to the next one. So in Columbia, if you see this one, in the, in the park, there was this cannon. And this cannon was a war prize purchased by hers during the Spanish-American War. So if you go back in the history, why are we not included in the Mongolians Exclusion Act before? Because we're classified as U.S. nationals. So because we're U.S. national, we're not to be treated as a, a, a person from another country like the Chinese or the Japanese. That's why we don't have the Exclusion Act. But then they also hated us. That's why they need to include us. So they need to put in 1934, that's why in the Angel Island report that in 1935, that was after 1934, 
they put the tidings McDuffie law making the Philippines as a, as a nation with the Commonwealth. So therefore, they come from a country. So there's a quota now for immigration. So they only have uh, 50 per person. That's why we have the person in the Angel Island. So that's one. We were we experienced exclusion just like the Chinese, but they not the same because we're U.S. national and we're classified as U.S. national. So the end of this session is that, like I said, this is a weaving of different narratives. So by going to that site, you will see the colonialism. As you know, in the colonialism, we were not even classified as a country. So that's why they call it Philippine insurgent uh, war or insurgent uh, rather than Philippine American war. It was only changed in 1998. So that's another narrative. So the good thing now, let's go to the end. We have now Soma Filipinas and Soma Filipinas is now a district so we can tell our story. We can put our heroes. We can also claim our space. So this is the space of empowerment in our community to provide us a new narrative of our history in America. Thank you. Thank you, MC. And what a wonderful way uh, to actually pull together all of the speakers. It is a weaving of stories. As you heard, um, all of our speakers actually refer to each other, which um, was beautiful to see. Um, and I also want to acknowledge in the last slide um, that there were several Filipino American women who were, you know, who are being um, shown throughout Soma Filipinas. And I just wanted to acknowledge as uh, October is Filipino American History Month. So you see here. And, uh, I, and uh, you know, this actually session, um, I, I forgot to mention in the beginning, along with other Pinais, I wanted to um, uh, dedicate this session to Dr. Don Wabalon, who was a key figure in San Francisco and San Francisco State um, as a professor there. So um, we have a few more minutes left and I thank all our speakers. Um, I'm glad I didn't have to mute you unlike this uh, presidential debate what we are <laughs> conflicting with. So I think we have a few questions, right? Um, let's see. Um, sorry, let me see the Q&A. Um, what has helped the Asian American community to overcome discrimination and racism? Anyone would like to take a stab at that? That's a, it's a big question, I know. I can start us off and if others have anything to add. Uh, honestly, on a personal level, I don't think we've overcome discrimination and racism. The very same racism and xenophobia that led to these exclusionary immigration policies that led to lynchings of Asian Americans back in the late 1800s, it, th those same feelings are surfacing today and we're seeing increasing rates of harassment and discrimination against Asian Americans and other immigrants. I think what also contributes to some of this is that there is a model minority myth that exists where all Asians are universal universally seen as being healthy, wealthy, and well-educated. And that model minority myth, unfortunately, does not take into account the broad diversity of the 50 different ethnic groups that speak 100 different languages in the US. And it actually also is used against us to make it seem like we're doing better than other racial ethnic minorities when we actually face very similar challenges. And it's used to wedge us apart from these other communities that we actually should be in allyship with. Thank you, and anyone else would like to answer that question? I think a lot of the gains that we have made have been in coalition with other groups of color and um, the organizing work, especially 60s, 70s, and 80s were uh, a time when uh, with started with uh, examples of the third world student strike at SF State and UC Berkeley. People could work together in, in uh, hand in hand and a lot of our gains were made that way. Wonderful. Well, and then, you know, also, you know, the Asian American community has been, you know, challenging, you know, these, you know, the laws that have been discriminatory, um, you know, throughout their time here. So, you know, um, Mary Tate challenging, you know, the segregated schools, but also um, immigration, who can become a citizen. Um, those were 
um, unequal treatment, uh, laundry ordinances, those were all lawsuits brought by um, members of the community really kind of fighting for their rights. So it's little known history, but it um, shows how, you know, the Asian American community has used the legal system. Yeah, in fact, the law establishing birthright citizenship was from Wong Kim Ark versus United States, where Wong uh, took his case all the way to the Supreme Court and won the right for uh, to be recognized as a U.S. citizen because he was born here. Um, and I know we have a few minutes left, and there's one other question that has come up. Uh, what has brought each of you into uh, studying history in historic places in Asian communities? And I know I'm going to pitch it that each of these speakers, raise your hand if you're actually formally educated as like a history major <laughs> or whatever. Erica is. I <laughs> <laughs> So Erica, actually, I didn't know that. Um, and Erica is actually very well known um, in terms of community development and, and affordable housing circles, right? <laughs> and so, um, and I'm an urban planner. Um, and so it's interesting that for, you know, I think when there's public health, we have law, we, you know, we, we're all over in terms of our formal training. Um, so I think it's interesting that each of us are, we, you know, we do work in, in our, historical like context of our communities and so what you know if you want to do real quick um one reference of what brought you to do the work you do now yeah i think if i can say my piece that the filipino narrative in the fabric of the u.s history should be asserted because we're always invisible in terms of history like for example we know about the Spanish-American War, but they didn't know the Philippine-American War. It was hidden. And then just like with Victoria Manalo Draves, he was accepted in the International Diving Competition, uh, Hall of Fame, but in the Bay Area, it's not yet accepted. Mm -hmm. It's not even included. And then when, when Fred Basconcillo was asking, uh, they said, oh, you should contribute. So therefore, it's another economic thing. So if you're not on the table, so you're not uh, being considered. And then the issue of uh, segregation for school, for example, like for example, the Bessie Carmichael, they have the Filipino Education Center. The immersion program is not even supported by the district. So you can say the discrimination is still there. So we have to assert the, the narrative. So as a former historian and not former, as a history teacher, my role is to uh, dig into research and also dig into what I call ethnotourism so that people will get familiarized that the story I'm sharing is the story that people should also know. Thank you, MC. And I know we have two more minutes left. Um, we have a few hands raised and some other questions. So this is, there's a lot. And before we go to the, to the questions, um, I just want to give a quick plug. Karen had mentioned that um, the Japanese YWCA is being considered in San Francisco at the local level for landmark designation. Another preservation and action um, item, call for action for support. The California State Historical Resources Commission is meeting on November 6th, it's virtual. Um, and there's the Chinese shrimp camp um, on the eastern edge of San Francisco Bay. Um, that is being considered to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So, you know, um, if you want to put in a public comment or a letter of support, um, you can visit the California um, State Historical Resources Commission website um, and send an email to the California SHPO State Historic Preservation Office in that support. We have so many questions and I don't know, Carrie. And we Michelle, can I just put in a, a plug for Yeah. <laughs> The Japanese YWCA building. Um, the next hearing before the Historic Preservation Commission will be on November 18th. So if you can get any support materials in before then, that would be great. After that, we'll go to the Board of Supervisors for two hearings and then ultimately to the mayor. So we are hoping that we are on track for official landmark status in 2021, which will be the 100th anniversary of the purchase of the property for the building. So please help us get to that point. 
Thanks. <laughs> Carrie, um, we have a few more questions and I know we're I at the, know. Top of the hour. Yeah, so. there's there's such great questions. Uh, <laughs> I know. I want so I everyone don't want to, to answer. Them. Yeah. Um, maybe we can ask, you know, one more question and then maybe like one or two people can answer. I just it's uh there's some kind of touching on personal uh right. personal things which I really like. Uh so, so yeah. Actually, I wanted, I, this is the question I'd ask all the speakers um, for, you know, those tuning in that may be in the city or nearby in the Bay Area. Um, what is one, what is your favorite, like, place in the city that's like an Asian American landmark or historic place that you feel like people should check out either in person, socially distanced or virtually to learn more about that. You know, many people may, they go to the Golden Gate Bridge, right? Or Coit Tower, where else can they go to see something just, you know, a, a really good, you know, place to just get some undiscovered um, information. Well, I'll plug the uh, San Francisco, Japantown. We have a, self-guided history walk that uh, consists of a number of stops around Japantown. Each stop is marked with a plaque that tells about the history there or a topic relating to community and culture. And you can also, um, you used to at least be able to reach it online uh, if you Google San Francisco Japantown History Walk. And it's, um, it's a project I got to work on and I think it holds up very well over time and takes you to some wonderful places. When it opens again, I would strongly suggest going to Angel Island, uh, but also is, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, there's some beautiful places even on Angel Island if you get to go on a tour or walk by yourself to even go and see um, the um, poems that are etched on the walls um, at Angel Island. It's very, I've seen pictures for, you know, since college and then I went two, three years ago in person for the first time and it's a, it's a whole other feeling. It elevates this, you know, this feeling um, is, as you get to, I don't think you could put your hand on the etchings, but you know, you're so close to it that you can feel it. Um, of like how long it took someone to, to put that on the wall and how they chose, you know, uh, what poem was ought to be placed there. So any other hidden gems? Erica. I would point out our friends at the Chinese Historical Society of America. It is the third Chinatown building designed by Julia Morgan. Um, when museums open up again, um, they will be open to share about um, the history of Chinese in America. And the other one is the Chinese Cultural Center, which is in the Hilton building. And um, it was there, it's there because the Chinese American community really fought for a public benefit when um, the Hall of Justice land um, was sold to a developer. And so because it was so close to Chinatown that it was so important for the Chinese American community to have a place where they could um, have their culture exhibited. And so those are two um, great resources that are in the Chinatown community. Michelle, if I can just do one more plug for ah. Angel Island. Uh, <laughs> no bias whatsoever from my part. Uh, but we are opening up our Angel Island Immigration Museum in the former Public Health Services Hospital building later this year. And that building has never been open to the public. So it's an exciting time for us. Uh, what is exciting too, I think, about historic preservation in API communities, getting to part of Roslyn's question and Alvin's question about existing institutional implicit racism, is I think that there's a consciousness among all of us represented on this panel that we cannot be just Asian and Pacific Islander advocates, but we actually have to look to our brothers and sisters in other racial ethnic communities and other marginalized communities. And we have to lean into our empathy and our allyship. And by doing so, I think that that's what begins to ensure that all of the different histories of injustices that our respective communities have endured get lift, gets lifted up. Beautiful. Thank you, Ed. I really appreciate that. 
And I know we're five minutes over time. So Carrie, I I bring it back to you. (laughs) Yeah. And I wanted to thank you, Ed, for answering one of the questions that um, I I guess as a follow-up, I'd I'd like all of you to answer, um, but just kind of what advice would you give young Asian Americans looking to preserve history in their respective cities? Um, And Ed, you said, just don't be afraid to speak up and, you know, you, you know, you see that your history is being overlooked, so share it. And I appreciate that. And I'm sure everyone on this panel appreciates that. They do that in all their work. So uh, yeah, with that, thank you so much again to everyone for your time. Uh, thank you, Michelle, MC, Grants, Karen, Erica, and Ed. Uh, we will send some follow-up links with uh, all this information to everyone who registered. I will also make the recording available. Uh, as well on Essa Paris's YouTube page. So keep a look out for that. But um, yeah, I wanted to say thank you for sharing your time with us. And I really encourage you to visit all of the places mentioned today, um, you know, on your next socially distanced walk. Uh, just get out there, you know, now with your renewed knowledge of these places, these special places and share them with everyone, you know, show them with people, you know, so. Thank you so much again for everyone, to everyone. So have a good night. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you.